So we've all taxed our minds, our hearts, poetry, politics. Now we come to pride, prejudice, and punditry. I'll do the punditry. He'll do the pride. No prejudices here. No prejudices here. So we'll cut that out. No, this is, uh, I'm fe it's the last day of the festival. The boat is nearing the shore. And I am a very, very, very lazy person. And I leave all the difficult sessions to Sanjoy, who eagerly gets into them and seems to have read every book there is to read when I have not seen him have the time to read it. Whereas for me, I, if I ever talk to Shashi, it's the best of both worlds because I've done my virtuous duty by being in conversation with one of our stars. At the same time, it's on autopilot. <laughs> Even if I was to say nothing or just to say a few words, um, the conversation moves so naturally forward because he has so much to say, so much to say and uh, always say it. Uh, which a polite way of saying he talks too much, no? <laughs> no, no. You can't do, talk too much for a Jaipur Lit Fest session, <laughs> ever. That's true. That's and true. Uh, otherwise, you never do. So thank you for being here with us at Suneva Fushi. As you already know, I am sort of addicted to reading from a page. Um, you lead an incredibly busy life as a popular, hands-on politician. Absolutely, I've seen how packed that is. You're also an improbably prolific writer. You had Henry's Last Battle published. Hello, silence on the sides, please. Uh, you an improbably prolific writer. You had Henry's Last Battle published when you were 10. Uh, I must tell you, I was 10 too, and I felt very, very jealous when I saw this published in Junior Statesman, and I said, oh my god, who's this? Uh, oh, that was Operation Bellows. OK, yeah. Mm. That was, uh, and the Operation Bellows was serialized in the Junior Statesman when he was quite grown up. He was 11 by then. Started the week before my 11th birthday. Yeah, so then. I mean, how many of you had your first published novel at 11? Any hands up? Shashi, you can put your hand. Uh, the GS was a very, very popular magazine, and I used to wonder, who's this guy? Why is he writing these things at 11? And they were very Biggles kind of books. That's exactly Which right. I didn't understand, because I wasn't reading Biggles, but Wise. I loved them. They were very, very good. Thank so, you. in fact, I'm going to change the first question, but the net seemed to indicate that you've written around 30 books at last count. Is that true? 23. 23, okay. The first question I want to ask you is, what comes first, your commitment to politics or your passion for the written word and why? But that's my script. I'm breaking into my own script. And <laughs> I'm requesting you to tell us a little bit about Operation Bellows, because it has such lovely memories for me of this big magazine circulated all across India. And um, yeah, I think they said you were 12. But no, no, they said I was 11. But the thing is that, you know, I mean, the fact is that um, I, I, I came to writing, honestly, because I didn't feel I had a choice. I was an asthmatic kid, and those were the days before inhalers and all these ways of, of coping with it. So essentially, you popped a strong pill and then spent the day and the night struggling to breathe. That was essentially what life as an asthmatic kid was all about in the early 60s and mid-60s. So what I did was I, I literally was sort of propped up in bed, um, and there, there was no television, obviously, in India in those days, or in not in Bombay, there were no... Uh, nobody had, you know, laptops and computers and mobile phones weren't even gleams in anybody's eye. No Nintendo, no PlayStation. So all I had were books. Books were my escape, my education, my, my entertainment, the works. So I read everything I could lay my hands on. And of course, because I was the oldest child in the family, I didn't have any elder brothers or sisters to borrow books from. I had this inconvenient habit of reading rather fast. I would finish library books in the car on the way home in Bombay traffic. So basically, uh, read my parents' books. And when I ran out of those, there were two options. One was to either play book cricket, which is like a fat book, and turn the pages, and the last digit is the runs made in that particular over, and so on. Or, alternatively, you write, because that's all you could do with, with, when you're awake and struggling, and so on. So I wrote, and I wrote very derivatively. So my first stories were entirely Enid Blyton mystery kind of things. I mean, she had the famous five, and the five find outers, and the secret seven, but she didn't have any six. So I created the six solvers who were Indian kids who went off, as I did, to a village in Kerala every year on compulsory vacations with their parents. And in my case, uh, my, my, my characters solved all the mysteries. 
I was really proud of those, but nonetheless, um, they never got published anywhere. Are they still around? Can we uh, find them They were them until, until, unfortunately, uh, a not very happy divorce, uh, which uh, resulted in... Uh, uh, you know, took the six trunks, solvers away? No, no, no. Trunks of uh, my scribbles from childhood all being flung away into the garbage in New York. Well, that's life. But the uh, six but anyway. solvers sounds brilliant. I think we need six solvers. <laughs> uh, we should. We, 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 we will revive that. But, uh, what, but anyway. So very that, quickly. Operation then I, then, Bellows, then, what then because then? I was slightly older by then, I was reading the Biggles books, Captain W.E. Johns, about this intrepid World War I pilot whose adventures continued well into the Cold War. Um, uh, I, I started writing, again, very derivatively. How do you learn? You write what you write, enjoy reading. So I wrote about this Anglo-Indian fighter pilot called Reginald Bellows, who sort of saved London single-handedly in the Battle of Britain or whatever else it was. Uh, and it was, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say it was a bit uh, uh, silly, but uh, for some reason, the editor of the Junior Statesman, uh, Desmond Doig, decided that it was good enough to publish. I had written in deadly earnest. He described it more as Baron Munchausen, you know, oh. this, these improbable fantasies of adventure. But anyway, so he serialized what I thought of as a novel, but properly, I suppose, was only a novella, over six installments, beginning with for my 11th birthday. And yes, it did win me a sort of uh, a following from, from our generation yeah, of yeah. readers and uh, potential writers. Um, and then um, I ended up, you know, once you've seen your name in print, it's terribly addictive. I mean, it's yes. like the, you know, the first bite of chocolate or the first kiss or something. It's, it's really, you know, you want to keep doing it. So. You won't go into the first kiss just now. <laughs> <All right. it's> gone. <laughs> but anyway, I, I kept doing it. So that's oh, it. Might. You are. That's that might my, be the last question. That's my question. writing career. La last question. <laughs> So now, what comes first, your commitment to politics, or your passion for the written word? You know, I've, I've actually never been a full-time writer. Um, at school, it was, you finish your homework and then you write. Um, uh, at college, same thing. And in college, there were also lots of extracurricular activities, uh, which all took precedence. Uh, and then at, at work, I mean, I, I went literally straight, defended my thesis on a Friday, my PhD, got on a plane Saturday, arrived in Geneva Sunday, began work Monday. So I literally never had an extended period of time to do nothing but write. And the result was that um, for me, writing was always something one did after one finished one's professional responsibilities. So I, I wrote evenings, weekends, or in the days when I had weekends, and those have also considerably disappeared, so I write when I can. And in politics, your principal obligation is to your voters, it's to the people who put you there. And because of that, I have had no doubt in my mind that their needs and demands take precedence. So um, they uh, will, will, will always have first dibs. And that's made me change in many I used to be an early morning person, but that's no use because uh, constituents are usually earlier in the morning than you are. Uh, so I essentially spend the day doing political work and um, and, uh, and really start writing after the last importunate visitor uh, finally realizes it's impolite to call or come, which means often it's after 10, 10, 30, sometimes 11 that I actually start writing. So it has been, it has been a challenge. And I must say, uh, not a week goes by without at least one day of thinking, damn, why don't I throw this all up and write all the time? Because that's when I'm happiest. But even after 10, 30 or so, I've seen, because all of us at the Jaipur Lit Fest are constantly writing. Uh, emails to you and to your assistant, and often you're quicker than your assistant, and even while you're writing, you, you do pick up and reply. I know, that's a terrible, terrible attention deficit disorder. No, Instead that's of wonderful. ignoring emails, I am actually keeping an eye on them. It's terrible. No, it's, it's wonderful. It's, 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 uh, now, your recent book, Pride, Prejudice, and Punditry, it presents a very panoramic view of your interests and obsessions, and David David R. has said, there's three parts to your being a writer. I think he's overstated that because he says one is you as a columnist and all, but I think we see less and less of that now because of so many things. There are book reviews, which I haven't seen any for a long time, magazine True. articles. Then there's the creator of literary fiction and the author of very heavyweight books that actually change the discourse on imperialism and uh, so, so many things in the recent past. Thank you. Um, now, uh, tell us about the literary fiction, beginning with your very first novel, The Great Indian Novel. Well, I mean, the literary fiction uh, was my first love initially, because even when I was writing in my uh, childhood and my teens, I wrote stories as much as I did sort of campus journalism. And, uh, and many, in fact, thought of me principally as a story writer. And when I joined the UN, I was careful to 
make sure I had permission to write. You know, I used to joke that just as James Bond had a license to kill, I had a license to write because I actually had official permission from the United Nations. And I must be the only writer on the planet whose copyright page carried the discla disclaimer saying that uh, though the author is an official of the United Nations, none of the opinions expressed by him or by the characters in the book are to be taken as those of the author in his official capacity. I mean, that really appeared for 29 years in every book published. But anyway, uh, the truth is that uh, that, that gave me uh, an extra incentive to, to, to concentrate on fiction. And because, you know, it was very difficult to violate the UN rules about offending member states if you were writing fiction. So I did. And, and the first uh, five books I published, four happened to be fiction. Um, and, and they were all um, part of my consistent desire to interrogate my own itch about India, but, you know, what, what India meant to me, uh, what it meant to the world, and perhaps um, could mean even more to the world. Um, and I tried to do it through fiction um, for the same reason as the Heineken commercial used to say, uh, you know, that they're the beer that reaches parts that other, other beers don't reach. I think fiction reaches parts that, that other, other kinds of writing doesn't. I mean, I, I do think that if you want to argue something, persuade a reader, influence their mind, then nonfiction is probably the way to go. But, but a, a fictional approach to, to certain issues will actually reach other parts of the reader's psyche, heart, emotions, etc., and bring them along. So the Great Indian novel was really, I mean, I had no idea. When you're writing a first novel, you never know if you can pull it off, and you never know if you'll ever do it again. So one throws everything into it. So I had thrown into it pretty much everything I felt about India to that point. I was 31 when I started writing it. Um, and uh, it, it has in it my love of contemporary Indian history, which I studied, of course, in college and so on. It has my, my, my sort of excitement about the potential of the Mahabharata and the Indian oral storytelling tradition as uh, a, a vehicle for conveying some of these interests and concerns. And the two fusing together into something which, to that point, hadn't much been attempted in Indian writing, which is satire. Yeah. So I wrote a satirical retelling of the great epic, the Mahabharata, which had, in fact, been told and retold for 800 years uh, between roughly 400 BC and 400 AD. Um, uh, and, and, and then people, we just stopped telling it. So I asked myself, why do we stop telling it? What would a 20th century Ved Vyas uh, tell about his India? And so I, I, my narrator was this um, uh, cantankerous old politician called Ved Vyas, nationalist politician, in his dotage and in his anecdotage, who dictates his memoirs to a South Indian secretary with a long nose called Ganapati, uh, <laughs> uh, and such are the secular uses of Indian divinity. And, and then I, I, I told the satirical story, including uh, one, one, one technique which I'm I, I, rather proud of because I actually came across it in some of the translations. Many of you may not know that the Mahabharata is actually verse. The entire epic was told in verse, and it's the longest poem uh, in human creation, five times as long as the Bible and so on. Uh, but most, almost every translation is, is in prose because obviously it's an enormous task to take on. Um, in fact, one Chicago scholar, J. A. B. Van Butenen, tried to translate it in poetry, and sort of 23 volumes into the effort, the poor man died. I mean, it just the, the, the task was too too immense for anyone's lifetime. So, um, one very interesting version, P. Lal's so-called transcreation, what it did was it it, it 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 is a prose translation, in which he occasionally breaks into verse to convey some of the poetic qualities of the original, and I thought this was a great literary technique that I could steal, which was to have my narrator breaking occasionally into doggerel, um, both because it, it reinforced the humor and the satire, and also because it p permitted transitions from rather momentous events. Because I was grafting the, the underlying story of the epic onto sort of a, 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 a framework narrative of the 20th century nationalist struggle. Um, and and um, when I began it, I didn't know I could pull it off. And I, I you know, uh, each time that I came across an insuperable problem, I got the narrator to, to break into, you know, doggerel, limericks, quatrains, even sort of a, a fake sonnet and an iambic tetrameter and so on, all of which was in order to carry the narrative forward. And in the end, I had, I had a lot of fun writing it, and to my very pleasant surprise, it was well received. It's still in print, so I have the gratification of people who weren't born when the book first came out. Uh, coming up clutching copies for me to sign, which is so, wonderful. So uh, if I may digress and go into a little bit of Jaipur Literature Festival praise, 
you know, we have younger and younger people turning up, and there was a, a girl called, I'm forgetting her name just now, it'll come back to me, Sanjoy will remember, and uh, she was 11, and then her mother rang up to say, would I um, blurb her book? And at 11, she's done the Mahabharat in verse. My word. And uh, she's done it well. And I met her mother and her grandmother, and I don't think they've done it. I think she's done it. So it's like you and with the Biggles <laughs> and all that. <laughs> Do you think you'll return to fiction again? And which is your favorite novel? Oh, come on. That's like uh, asking a mother who's her favorite child. You can't I possibly. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I would not while the tape is running. No, I mean, I, to be honest, uh, you know, you really do put everything of yourself into each book. And each, uh, I mean, the thing I can say with some pride, I have three novels and a collection of short stories, and each one is so different from the other that um, I'd like to think I, I tried something novel in each of the novels, and I tried to do it with, with everything I had in me at the time. And I, I really, you know, I mean, once a novel is out there, like a child, you have to let it make its own way in the world. And I think I've, I've, I've done that with my, with my own books. I wouldn't pick a favorite, but each one means a lot to me. And of course, the great new novel being the first one, uh, written at a time when I didn't know that I could, as it were. Um, and then show business, which is very different, but which again, um, you know, there's a famous New Yorker cartoon, a classic of this, um, this, this sort of frantic bobbing head in the ocean. And just out of his reach uh, in a little sort of um, uh, boy uh, is a typewriter, and in the typewriter <laughs> is one sheet of paper with the words second novel. Ah. So I had to get that second novel out quickly just to feel that I could do that. Uh, and then I, 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 I abandoned the satirical form for a fairly serious novel, which was so serious that the publisher in, at the launch uh, called it a necessary novel. Oh. It was at my novel, The Riot, about yes. communal violence in India. Uh, and, and each of those, um, each of those, uh, precisely because they're different, means that I can tell readers, if you don't like that one, please read that because it's very different. Or if you do like that one, there's more where it came from, so read those. So you know, that, that way I can get to sell my books. Uh, again, because this is more a conversation than a very structured session, since mm -hmm. we're an informal group of people on the last day of a successful festival, your son is a very brilliant literary writer as he well. Is, Kanishka's is. book, uh, Swimmer, Among Swimmer Among the Stars. Yeah, so Kanishka is, is, I think, far more gifted touch with than I am. He, he writes absolutely brilliantly. Uh, and those of you who haven't read his stories, uh, Swimmer Among the Stars, um, which was published here by Aleph, and it's been published everywhere in English and French, etc. And, and it's, uh, it was so good that uh, one of the American reviewers compared him to Borges, Saramago, and 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 uh, and Calvino, in, and in not to Shashi Tharoor, thank God. <laughs> and not he had been grateful for that. Um, uh, but unfortunately, uh, the realities of life in America meant the moment he had a child, he realized he couldn't afford to live on his writing. He needed a job, or he wouldn't pay, be able to pay the insurance. This is this is what no, modern America is all about. The book will so come. One day, I hope he will be. Of course, he will. able to I get have, back have, to fiction. But I, he's, uh, I have deep respect for him as a writer. Your book, An Era of Darkness: The British Empire in India, made a very deep impact. It, it changed the discourse in so many subtle ways, um, uh, and impacted many other writers and the themes they picked up, both in India and the rest of the world. Yeah, I tell was, us about that. I was rather gratified by the fact that it actually made the Sunday Times bestseller list in London. So the Brits were reading it, even though in initially a lot of the responses I thought must have been fairly defensive. And I, I actually did uh, spend um, uh, a week or so promoting it in the UK and, and uh, had something, more than one event every day. So there was a lot of feedback and much less pushback than I expected. I think the Brits uh, understood that the argument I was making needed to be listened to. So I'm, I'm pleased about that. It all actually started off with a speech, not, not with a serious... I thought from a debate. Exactly. There was, a, there was a debate at the Oxford Union, which actually wasn't about colonialism per se. It was about reparations, yeah. which was not a big theme of mine, though I'm now sort of saddled in people's imaginations with it. I actually decided to, to accept the debate. I was on my way to the Hay Festival anyway, and from London to Hay, you could go by Oxford. So I said, why not do it? Uh, but the other reason was that, was that um, um, I thought it would give me a good chance to rebut some of the stuff I had seen, some of the odious stuff I'd seen written over the, the last uh, 10 or 15 years before this debate. You had Ferguson, you had Andrew Roberts, you had this uh, 
insufferable gentleman I've never met called Lawrence James, who actually described British colonialism as one of the most altruistic acts in the history of humankind, which, you know, uh, was so appalling. There actually were Brits who believed this. And then I saw a YouGov poll where something like 57% of young Britons thought the empire was a good thing and they would love to have it back. Well, we didn't want it back, so I thought it was time to explain to them why. And that's, so the debate gave me, an, on the reparation thing, I actually said, you know, uh, I don't think it's quantifiable, the damage done by the British to India. Uh, and because any credible amount would not be payable, and any payable amount would not be credible, forget about monetary reparations, give a symbolic one pound a year, it's more important that the Brits learn to say sorry, which they still haven't done, I might add. Uh, except for poor old Archbishop Welby, who flung himself on the ground at Jallianwala Bagh and apologized, but nobody representing the crown has yet done so, and that, I think, is still, still a matter of regret. But anyway, so the Oxford debate went so well that um, not only did the debate itself end with the, uh, the people flooding the sort of uh, uh, the lobby, as it were, for so long that the, the counting heads took them so long, the official reception afterwards was delayed by half an hour. That was how, 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 how successful it was. But then when they put it on YouTube, uh, I think within the first 24 hours, there were 3 million downloads, and it just became a huge thing. So my publishers, of course, rang up and said, you've got to convert this to a book. And I said, why bother? Everyone knows this. And they said, no, they don't, said David Davidari. He said, because if they did, your speech wouldn't have gone viral, yes. which I suppose suddenly made sense. And so I decided to take it on. And, um, and I'm pleased to say that though I, you know, obviously the book required more serious substantive research than a, a debate speech tossed off um, uh, sort of on the fly, uh, uh, in the end um, it stuck largely to the framework of the argument rather than a conventional narrative. And the argument therefore is what impelled the book and, and has still uh, found and readers. It, it is, according to David, it is the single most successful hardback non-fiction, non-textbook, obviously, uh, of all time, which is not bad in India. Yeah. Mm. And also, it sparked off a whole load of perhaps more researched, more thought out uh, books. So it, it, been a it, lot. It, it led to a lot more than just the book. Now, um, just three more questions very quickly, and then we move on to the audience. Uh, to quote you on the Indianness of cricket, now, how many people here follow cricket? Who are the cricket people? Yeah, so enough to get the conversation going. Uh, that famous phrase, because he, you've written several books on cricket, uh, several? No, I've written several articles on cricket, but no, you've no, done not, a book only with one book. And, the, one. and that too was a co-authored book. With, uh, Sha Sha with Shariar Khan Shariar of Pakistan. Khan. Um, it was uh, a, a Pakistani and an Indian <coughs> writing about Indo-Pakistan cricket over the, um, uh, over a little over five decades at that point. And he was very much an insider, head of the Pakistan cricket board and so on. And I was very much the outsider, the cricket fan. And it actually worked rather I well. I remember you did a wonderful session with us also. Yeah, that's right. So um, you've written a lot about the Indianness of cricket, uh, quoting sociologist Ashish Nandi's memorable phrase that cricket is really an Indian game accidentally discovered by the British. That's right. Uh, tell us about your affinity for the game and what it represents in its psychology for, for India and for Pakistan. Well, it, it's a lifelong obsession. I'm a dad bless his soul, took me off at the age of seven to watch my first test match, which was the Englishman in Bombay. And, uh, and I had a number of memorable, I mean, we played much less in those days of international games. So when they came, it was a big thing. And we went and the stands were full. But I also watched uh, domestic cricket. People don't believe this, but the Iranji Trophy match between Bombay and Mysore, I remember in 67, 68, when Badeka got a triple hundred, there were about 80,000 people in the audience for a Ranji Trophy game. Um, so it, it got into my blood, as it were. I just love the game. And then I went off, unfortunately, uh, to study graduate school in America, where not only was there no news of cricket, no, none of the newspapers even mentioned a score, but, uh, but shortwave radios in those days couldn't be had for love or for money. So I was completely cut off until the library would get two-week-old British newspapers where I could see the scores of matches from two weeks ago. Uh, now, that, in many, many Indians of my generation who went to America, they simply lost interest. They just stopped following the sport. In my case, the keen edge of deprivation sharpened my, my cricketing passion. So I became even more obsessed with the game because I was deprived of it. And eventually, I could finally get a shortwave radio and 
tune into the scratchy static on BBC Roundup, Sports Roundup on the World Service. And, you know, those, 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 those precious few minutes every day where if you were lucky and got a good reception, you would know what happened in that day's cricket. And so anyway, to cut a long story short, I kept it up and I, I've, stayed, I've stayed involved. Now, what does it mean? I think in, uh, my, 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 the, the essay I've written about cricket in India is slightly jokey, but it's also slightly true that, you know, everything about the rhythm of the sport uh, accord so well with the Indian sensibility, including our acceptance of the capriciousness, capriciousness of fate. I mean, we uh, have a cultural belief that the gods are quite capable of being perverse, and, and cricket is like that, right? And uh, random things like a, a, a burst of rain or a, uh, something else happening to the pitch could transform uh, all your plans that you've you know, started the match with and things like that. And that's what life is all about, right? It's just when you're timing the force sweetly off the, the middle of the bat that uh, the unplayable shooter comes along and bowls you. And life is like that. It's something Indians instinctively understand. So that's, that's what that answer is. But for me, I think what it also meant was it was part of this coming of age of a post-colonial country. To take a sport that initially we acquired by accident. The British played it amongst themselves. There weren't enough of them, so they got Indians basically to do the menial work, you know, to prepare the grounds and pick up the balls. And then they finally said, let the Indians come and bowl and field. And then eventually, to be better at it, most of the time anyway, than the English, was particularly gratifying. So there you are. It was a bit of a sort of colonial ship on the shoulder, too. <laughs> and for Pakistan, it's a slightly different story because it was part of the uh, creation of a, of, a, of a Pakistani identity. The militarization and the, the sort of chauvinism that accompanied it in Pakistan is an interesting story all by itself. So they had to be better than us at cricket. Now, one of my favorite books, absolutely actually my favorite book of, written by you, uh, was published by my daughter Meru Gokhale, which is not why. Uh, <laughs> and it's a book called Tharurosaurus. Oh, <laughs> that was Meru's idea, actually. And Tharurosaurus is about your impish love of long words. And uh, it's a riot, that book. And uh, that leads me into something which I haven't written here, and I'm very bad at making up questions which I haven't written down. So here my question was, what is the longest word do you know? Does this habit or hobby of using long words stem from vocabulary vanity, or is it a strategy to obfuscate? Oh. But before I come to that, I want to also tell all of you about absolutely if somebody, some interviewer deigned to ask me a question, they usually say, oh, I mean, they don't ask me too many of these questions, but they said, what is your favorite ever session in the Jaipur Literature Festival? I would vote for the session at the British Library on P.G. Wodehouse and why people in India have stopped reading P.G. Wodehouse. And we had a biographer of P.G. Wodehouse whose jaw dropped all the way to his knees because uh, this gentleman there began quoting uh, without a book. He just read out, I don't know, he went on and on reading. So I think if you could amuse us, we reading. need to be amused. Do you know, know a few P.G. Wodehouse lines since we are in this idyllic place? And yeah, we need P.G. Wodehouse. And Sanjoy, if you remember, it's also deeply political because in India, now they have stopped prisoners from reading P.G. Wodehouse. Well, a prisoner, yes, I think. Well, that's another conversation altogether. But right now, we yeah, want I mean, I, I, I your did. longest word, and we want a little bit of PG Wodehouse. No, I mean, first of all, this whole long word thing is, 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 is simply not fair. I mean, it, it started from a very short, the, the entire thing in India started because I was so exasperated by a, a scurrilous and indeed libelous attack on me by a, an unmentionable journalist on television that I, I, I issued a tweet saying this was an, a, a, uh, a farrago of uh, misrepresentations, distortions, and outright lies broadcast by a, a showman masquerading as a journalist or something like that. But the farrago, for some reason, there was this puzzled tweet from the Oxford English Dictionary on Twitter saying, why have 10 million people in India started looking up the word farrago? And because uh, they'd never had more than three searches a day or something. And suddenly there was a spike for a million. And, and I didn't know, because I had used that word at St. Stephen's College in the early 70s in my debates. I didn't know it was not a known word. The, the command of the English language in India has declined precipitously since my college days. And one of the reasons, which entirely understand and explicable, is, is the advent of modern communications. Because in those days, everybody had to tune into the English language news, uh, the, the English on television or, or on radio, because there was only one channel you could get the news on, right? 
we suddenly have this proliferation of channels and everything else, and now every linguistic group in India can get all their entertainment in their own mother tongue, can get all their news in their own mother tongue, and do. I mean, but they Kerala, also get it from Shashi Tharoor. Well, in Kerala, there are sort of 13 all news channels. No one, I mean, Kerala used to be a very Anglophone state. My predecessor, Mr. Krishna Menon, uh, won an election campaigning entirely in English. If he tried that today, he'd lose his deposit. No one would understand it. It's as simple as that. So you've got a situation where mother tongues, or the vernaculars, as the British call them, uh, have really risen in prominence, and as a result, what the quality of English goes. Anyway, I didn't realize that no one knew what Farago was, but the result was that it suddenly went up, and then people decided to start joking about it and call you know, me Mr. Farago and all these other things. And the next thing I knew was that um, there was a thing. So then I decided, okay, if I'm going to be uh, accredited for using obscure words, which of course I didn't naturally want to do because when you're writing or speaking, your idea is to reach an audience. You want to be able to communicate in words they understand. I had no desire to be incomprehensible. But I said, you know, let's try and turn this, this parody or this attack on me to my own advantage. So I decided to deliberately do this now. And so, for example, when my publishers wanted me to announce the imminent release of my book, The Paradoxical Prime Minister, I tweeted, um, this book is more than um, an, a 400-page exercise in floxinos in the uh, which means uh, <laughs> the act of estimating something or someone as worthless. I wanted to say to people, I'm not just saying Mr. Modi is worthless. I've gone into this in great detail and substantiated my arguments, and it's more nuanced than that. And so I issued the tweet. So then that became a thing. And to my horror, when little three-year-olds and four-year-olds were wheeled out by their parents to pronounce floxinosi nihilipilification to me, and little videos were coming out. And then, of course, there is actually a longer word than that, which is pneumono-ultramicroscopic silico-volcanoconiosis, which was uh, actually a made-up word, made up by doctors, uh, for a disease that almost no one has, which comes from inhaling very fine particles of silicone off an erupting volcano. So you can imagine that. Uh, not a lot of people who have that, but, but that's the longest word in the English language. Um, and so on. So after a while, this long word thing uh, became too much of a caricature. I did use it, uh, obscure words, once in a while, but I usually give the meaning. So I said, for example, um, uh, when a, a particular politician who'd been elected with my party's support and alliance with us dumped us and switched over to the BJP, uh, I said, word of the day, snollygoster, first usage, 1848, uh, definition, a shrewd, unprincipled politician, latest usage today. I didn't mention the guy's name, his states, nothing else, but everyone knew what I was talking about, and suddenly Snollygoster in, in, entered the Indian political vocabulary. I tried again a, a few weeks ago with allodoxia, which is um, uh, a fear of you know, discomfort with, with unconventional opinions, but um, that didn't somehow strike a strike a strike a, a chord quite as much we'll we'll think of a few more uh, with time but it's in other words i'm just laughing at myself and using these i'm not actually saying that everyone must use these words in everyday conversation that would be silly and most of my tweets or speeches or whatever i hope you'll find entirely comprehensible so that's why this is this but is Therurosaurus was lovely yeah Therurosaurus is uh, her daughter who was a publisher of penguin in india Deciding that um, they wanted to have a, a, a book of words, and, and she sort of talked me into it in a taxi at the Jaipur Literary Festival as we were heading to a bibulous reception, and somehow I managed to say... No, because yeah. it was funny. Children love it. I mean, it's not mocking long words. It's encouraging yeah. children to use, or anybody, because it's, it's uh, very important to do not have only very short words in our <laughs> brain. Now, the right. last question uh, here... No one suffers from lethologica, which is one of the words in that book. <laughs> which is forgetting the right word, is lethologica. You suddenly, you're about to say something and oops. So you know, before it's I... trembling in the trip of your tongue, it doesn't come out. And then later when you're home, of course, and then you suddenly remember it. The word for the word for remembering, not remember the word. Lethologica, now I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> it happens to juniors too, Renu. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to ask you my last question and then move on to the audience. Mm -hmm. a, you can give a yes, no, maybe answer if you want. Uh, the Indian National Congress, of which you're a prominent leader, is undergoing a protracted... Oh, let's forget this. We want Woodhouse. Woodhouse, absolutely. Well, I mean, you, you really can't distill Woodhouse in a short answer. I mean, the thing is that 
There's oh, everything about him. There is both the plotting, the silly ass es escapades, the entire uh, mood that's evoked, which, which but actually read probably... But line. I'm sure evoked. you know some Yeah, lines. of course I do. So and do there's it. also the style, the words, the language. So, so you got sentences like, you know, she had more curves than a scenic railway. Uh, <laughs> or for somebody, you know, losing the battle of the bulge. He looked as if he'd been poured into his clothes and had forgotten to say when. <laughs> um, and the, the classic, um, uh, you know... If he wasn't actually disgruntled, he was far from being gruntled, <laughs> which, uh, which you know, um, again, that's a, the word he sort of pretty much invented. So you had these these short ones, and then you had these rather sort of brilliant things. He was also a playwright of of, of, of music hall comedies, so he had this tremendous capacity to understand timing and so on. So you know, she looked like one of those portraits of the mistresses of Bourbon kings, uh, which would convince you that the king in question was um, a man of steel impervious to fear or else short-sighted. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that was the sense. Or um, 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 uh, gosh, what was it? The, 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 the younger sons of the British aristocracy um, who found themselves in the position of the, I think, I think it was the, the tadpole. There was a particular fish. I Forgive me for forgetting which it was. I'm vegetarian, so you can excuse me. Um, um, who, um, after producing, you know, because they spawned lots of eggs, I'm, I'm ruining the line, but something like, after producing 1,300,000 uh, uh, little tadpoles, cheerfully resolves to love them all. Uh -huh. I mean, you know, that, that sort of thing. I mean, uh, anyway, that's neither here nor there. But the point is, the style was integral to the, the capacity of enjoyment, and there's a lot of subversion uh, of the English language, of classical allusions, of, you know, uh, he groaned and winced slightly like Prometheus watching his vulture drop by for lunch. You know, things like that. I mean, uh, it's just, the, 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 you know, um, uh, he, he cleared his throat in that different manner that, pronounced, that, 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 that reveals an Englishman on the continent is about to speak French. You know, things, things like that. I mean, there's just so much, so much um, uh, in Woodhouse. It's unbelievably you know, pleasurable, memorable. Um, and I thought that the reason Indians loved him as much as they did, because he, the last country on earth by Woodhouse was a current bestseller, selling on railway station platforms and so on, was India. I mean, well into the 80s until the early 90s, that was the case. Um, and I argued that it was because, in fact, his ability to subvert the conventions of English literature, of the assumptions of imperial overlordship actually appealed to the Indians because the only passport you needed to his world of enchantments was the English language. Since the world he was writing about didn't exist even in England and possibly never existed, uh, it was a product of his own imagination. There was no act of allegiance that an Indian reader needed to pay to the assumptions of British colonialism. All you needed was the language and you had it, you could enjoy Woodhouse. And I've told the story of my, of my, my, mother, my then mother-in-law, uh, sadly no longer, but a good friend, um, who was the daughter of Kailashnath Karju, therefore of an Indian nationalist politician. Uh, when he was governor of, of Orissa, Lord Mountbatten came visiting, wanted something to read. And he had never read Woodhouse, but the Indian nationalists had an entire shelf full of Woodhouse books. And, and his daughter could introduce, uh, could introduce um, the, the, the British imperial uh, viceroy to the works of this British humorist. Well, I think we need to give a clap to the president of the St. Stephen's P.G. Wodehouse Society. The first one in the world, as it was. The society, not the president. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. well, we were going to ask you about the political scenario, but I don't think it works now. I think we will not blame it on Rahul Gandhi as everything in the world is blamed. P.G. Uh, Wodehouse is a safer territory, more it's enjoyable. safer territory. Right. I think we open up to questions now. Who has the mic and who has the, who has the hands up? We've stunned them into silence, Namita. Yes. Oh, oh there's Marcus right on Marcus the back. Marcus, always. If Marcus can dance Bollywood, then Marcus can ask questions. Uh, as a lover of cricket, uh, what is your opinion about the hundred? You know, we don't have it in India, so I've never seen. Uh, I, I think it's probably a bit pointless, because the only difference between the 100 and the 2020 format is 20 deliveries, uh, and this peculiarity that you have one odd over, I think, of, 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 of uh, the wrong number of balls. I mean, I, I think 
it's magical that cricket lends itself to three different formats. Um, and, and therefore, there's no intellectual reason why there shouldn't be a fourth format. But until I see the game, I'm going to be difficult to persuade that it represents enough of a departure from any of the existing formats to be a different for, so form of the sport. Uh, there is no question that the entire logic, rhythm, content, strategy, skills required in each of the three formats is different. And that's amazing. There is no sport in the world. Uh, I mean, you've got five-a-side football and 11-a-side football, but that's about it, right? There's no sport in the world that lends itself to this kind of extraordinary differences, and I love that about cricket. Uh, but if you want to create a fourth format, you have to explain why it is so different as to be qualitatively worth watching uh, for an experience that is, is, is different from the others. And I haven't, I mean, as I said, I've not seen a game. We haven't played it anywhere outside England yet, as far as I know. Uh, but it's too close. I mean, you, you know, if you, if you were playing, I don't know, um, a different number. Uh, if you had, say, 10, 10 ball overs instead of, instead of several sixes and then suddenly a 10, uh, which, again, I don't quite see the logic of that. Um, if, if you did something that obliged uh, captains um, uh, to, to have to think differently and players to play differently, then you could persuade people to watch uh, a format like this. Imagine if, for example, uh, you had 10 10 ball overs. You couldn't take a bowler off mid-over. So the fellow had to, if he was bad, you had to suffer the consequences for 10 balls. Uh, and maybe uh, you would have a rule that essentially required 10 different bowlers to bowl them. So if a wicketkeeper and 10 all-rounders in each team, suddenly it becomes a different game. But you don't have any of those rules in the 100. So may as well watch 10 20, 20 which at least everyone has now wrapped their heads around. Does Kanishk's twin also use words, or is he totally allergic to them? No, he's, the, he's a diplomatic uh, uh, columnist for the Washington Post, Ishan, Ishan Tharoor. And I'm proud to say that last year he won the American Academy of Diplomacy Award for the best diplomatic uh, columnist in America, uh, which uh, you know, I, I, I'm terribly proud of. Um, Kanishk, who we talked about earlier, who is not writing fiction as I want him to, and as I think his publishers desperately want him to, he's sitting for the last six years on several three-book contracts from, from reputable publishers, um, is, is senior editor of Foreign Affairs magazine. So they both do have a, a taste for international affairs and, and global politics. And both your sisters have just written books. Uh, both are interested, but only one is a writer. And my sister Shobha um, has, uh, she's, she's actually a children's writer, and she's published six or seven rather successful children's books, including one that's coming out from HarperCollins uh, this week. I'm launching it in Delhi and on the 25th. a book on your mom. But she's also now written a book for adults, uh, which is a biography of my mother, the extraordinary, ordinary life of, you know, this woman who was born in a village and grew up and found herself a housewife in London and, and, and Indian cities and brought up three children and all of that. So uh, it's the kind of story that every one of us can tell at home about our mothers, I'm sure, uh, but no one ever thought of putting it into a book until Penguin commissioned her to do it. So there she is. Am I allowed to ask a last question or, or, or second last? There's a question which, I mean, all of us would benefit from, which is time management. And you're very good at time management. You're Look at as, all the time I'm spending here, people. I'm terrible. No. <laughs> I the should festival, be writing. You know, we, after the festival, we vote how helpful people are. And all this guy is always on time. He ha I mean, he handles his time. There's lots of people. I mean, if Sanjay wrote a book on time management, it would probably be very good. <laughs> uh, if William wrote a book on time management, it may not work. <laughs> but you know a lot about time management. How do you do it? I, I think it really comes from that childhood asthma, which was really the most character-shaping thing I ever went through, I think. You know, when you're taking examinations while struggling to breathe, it really makes you concentrate better and, 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 and work harder. Um, so. Um, I've always, I think, believed that every waking minute. But do you have a list of things to do or things, or it's all in your head? It's all in my head. I mean, it's because part of the problem is I've unfortunately been in professions where I couldn't regulate my time. When I was at the United Nations handling the Yugoslav Civil War, uh, you know, I can't sit down to write a novel and suddenly get a phone call saying there's been a bomb in the market in Sarajevo. What, what do we do tomorrow? You know, what do we do today? So there's a whole lot of stuff going on that, that you, have to, you have to grapple with. And since I had, fortunately for me, because it kept me engaged, an exciting and interesting UN career, and then I had an exciting and interesting political career, there's always been that unpredictability to my schedule that honestly uh, makes any time management lessons from me an absolute travesty. 
Uh, all I do is try and use every minute that's available to me, uh, doing whatever it is I happen to be doing. If I'm at, in Maldives at Soneva Fushi enjoying the JLF, I will do my best to get as much out of that experience as I can. So when young Neha says, let's go off and look at the stars through, from the observatory, which I had been to Soneva Fushi, Fushi, Fushi before and not known there was an observatory. So I said, let's go, and we went and looked at the stars, and I enjoyed that. So I think it's, it's living in the moment. You know, there's a wonderful thing that Walter Pater wrote about art, which he said, basically, the only purpose of art is to give meaning to your moments as they pass. So if you spend an hour before a painting, or you spend five minutes before a painting, if, it's given you, if that painting has given you some meaning, that's all that art is supposed to do. And I, I find that applies to almost everything in life. It applies to writing, it applies to the books and poems and, and, and all the other things. And it also applies to what we do every day. If, if that moment is not mean, there's no meaning or is actually you know, counterproductive, walk away. I mean, it's as simple as that. And, and otherwise, if you're doing something and you want to do it or you're supposed to do it, then get the most out of it and give the most of yourself to it. I'm afraid that's not much of a, much, not much of a tip for time management. It works for me. It's a good tip for life management, I guess. And I think I'm getting signals. Oh, well, we have time. Are there, uh, let's have one more question. Sanjoy, have you put your hand up for a question? <laughs> you had two questions. You only asked one. No, no, I've asked. I've asked. Yes. Yeah. Lucy. Yeah. So we've, we've heard so much about you today. Sorry. Oh we've, we've heard so much about you today, and, and I've learned more about what you do and what you strive for, and there seems to be so many different areas that you dabble in. This could be a very easy question or a very complex question, but have you discovered your purpose? And if so, what is it? The purpose has always been to make a difference in whatever I'm doing. It, it's not just one purpose, in the sense that if I... I mean, I really have had this sort of... Um, obsession with doing everything that I do as well as I possibly can. And I try and impart that to, to my kids, to everybody else that I, I am ever asked to give advice to is, be the best version of you that you can be. And, and frankly, no one can be better than you at being you, right? So just be you and, and, and be you every moment of it. And that means understanding yourself, understanding your potential and your own limitations. Not everybody can win a 100 meter dash and nobody, not everybody can write a good novel or a good poem or whatever. But if you challenge yourself sufficiently and discover you're able to do certain things, then you don't let yourself down by not doing them. You, you make the effort. Making an effort is to me extremely important. There's this old cliche about, you know, you can fall down seven times as long as you get up eight times. And that's, that's saying, I mean, life has had lots of setbacks. I've been through several in the world of Indian politics. Uh, but, um, but I've just been determined, uh, you know, uh, you, you, you have enough faith that whatever you do, you can do it well enough to actually be valuable in, in doing it. That's, that's about it. I'm sorry it sounds so fuzzy, but I think ultimately we all, I think, in life need to be anchored in ourselves. And for each of us, there may be, different. It may, there may be one overwhelming sense of purpose that sustains you, or there may be a general sense of a commitment to making a difference. I, I certainly have never been in a place where I was living for myself or, or just living for, for um, I mean, it, I always needed a purpose beyond myself. And that is what I've, I seek to fulfill every minute of my life. Pavan has a question, which, from the look on his face, could be anything. <laughs> Pavan. Uh, Shashi, you were talking of purpose in life and what you want to do. Is your huge Twitter following for you an asset or a liability? Well, look, I mean, it's an asset because it multiplies my message to a larger audience, and presumably it has helped sell some books as well. But it's also a, a liability because it obviously attracts all the trolls, and certainly a good chunk of those followers are, you know, uh, trolls. In fact, they're also in some cases uh, sort of bots that the BJP sort of pays to set up in order to sort of issue uh, 18 copies of the same attack on me <laughs> over and over again under different names. I mean, that, that happens all the time. Social media is, is very much, uh, you know, uh, uh, a double-edged sword. You know that. I mean, it's, there's, there's, an awful lot of, um, there's an awful lot of negativism built into it. Anonymity is possible, which is one of the reasons why Elon Musk says he may not buy Twitter anymore, is because a lot of these anonymous accounts may well be fake. There may not be a real human being behind them. Or rather, there might be a hundred such accounts with one person behind them sending out tweets for a fee for his, you know, his party, uh, has paid him to do it or whatever. And I've certainly had more than my fair share of abuse uh, over the years, and I've just learned to ignore it. In fact, I remember uh, 
a lovely story Natwar Singh, your old boss, told me about when he entered politics. And um, Indira Gandhi swore him, I mean, was present at the swearing in um, uh, for, his, for his minister. She was minister of state for steel or something. And he was in a suit. And he very apologetically mumbled to the prime minister, uh, sorry, ma'am, I'll get a few bungalows stitched. And she said, no, Natwar, you better grow a thicker skin. <laughs> and, and I thought that was extremely good advice. Uh, for, for entering politics. I, I started off being as sensitive and vulnerable and fragile as all of us are when people wrongly and unfairly accuse us or insult us. I learned to grow that thicker skin and, and, and to ignore some of those trolls. So now the asset part is once again uh, more valuable to me than the, the how, liability. How many followers? 8.3 million or something like that. It's not, not all that much. Not right? that much. Not that much. Um, <laughs> Mr. Tharoor, there's uh, one correction, if I may. Uh, you mentioned about Mahabharat being the only ballet. Uh, you know, that's uh, poetic, right? But I'd like to bring to your notice that Guru Granth Sahib is 1430 pages of just poetry. That's right, and Dohas. And, 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 and of course, but it's only poetry. Um, there's no I mean, proof. I think the two caveats would be that the, there are many, many recessions of the Mahabharata, and there are some that are longer than 1,450 pages. Are they? Oh, Absolutely. Okay. I mean, if you take all 18 parvas and you translate the longest versions of them uh, in full, you will end up with longer than that. Uh, but the second thing also is that the Guru Granth Sahib, as you know, is made up of contributions yeah. by multiple authors. And yeah. you could say the same of the Mahabharata, yes. but uh, many of these things were created before they were put together and compiled in the Granth Sahib, whereas right. the Mahabharata was essentially created for itself. So in that so, sense... So it, it is, is a massive anthology, or it is the most revered anthology in the world. The Granth Sahib is, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. You had a question, I think that's a... Take a mic, take a mic. We actually, actually have six minutes left, I'm amazed. Mm. So, you know, I've got a bunch of friends, and in fact, more than a bunch of friends, a lot of people in Bombay who think, it's a question mark, Shashi Tharoor, the Prime Minister of India someday, everybody wants to know it will happen. <laughs> so no, you, you know our country, you know our politics, I you know my party. That, yes, the, I mean, that's, I, I that's the drawback. I minute thinking about that, but, because but ultimately, you know, these are things, um, uh, uh, if at all they ever happen as it, as it did to Manmohan Singh was a sheer accident. Uh, and if it, if, it, if, it, uh, if it doesn't happen, that would be much more likely. Uh, you just go on doing the best you can with whatever opportunities you get. The, the challenge that people like Pavan keep needling me to do is to create opportunities to make more of a difference. And that's also not been that easy. Mind you, uh, uh, I, I have made a contribution, I believe, at least in things like moving some of the political conversation uh, during my time in politics. But I've been uh, quite struck by the extraordinary limitations we have in our system to people coming in from nowhere, really. I, I don't have any that belong to a political family or still dynasty. Like to see that happen. And trying to, to make a difference. Yeah. Well, thank you for the kind words, or thank your friends for the kind words. I mean, the truth is that as long as I can, I can try and do something to move the needle, I will. I promise. Good, great. A, a last question? You, uh, wait for the mic. No, we have two questions. We have time for two questions. So, no, there's time. Are you sure? Uh, my, my, mine was just to follow up on the political question is that um, how long do you think the status quo will be that um, the BJP are in power and the uh, Congress party, your party, are in, in opposition? I mean, it's been, it's been quite a long. How long has it been so far? It must be one of the. Eight years. Eight years, but. Yeah, oh, I mean, only eight years. But, but you know, if it carries on for another election, it'll be one of the records that when you look at the G8 or whatever India's right. part well, of. Well, no, Nehru had probably, uh, strictly speaking, had 18 years because uh, he actually became prime minister before independence. There was an interim government formed in 1946, yeah. and he went on till 64, so that's, that's, that's 18 years, and that's, that's a while. Uh, Indira Gandhi had 11 in her first stint, and then she had four in her second. Uh, so, I mean, there have been these two examples that were long, but India has also had a lot of very short-lived governments. Um, and the BJP clearly, you know, will complete 10 years and be, be uh, at the moment, as the polls suggest, they are in poll position uh, for a third term. Um, what can we do to prevent that? I mean, the, these are uh, conversations that have been going on for some time. Part of the problem is we have, as you know, a, a first-past-the-post system and multiple parties. There are 46 political parties in parliament today, some with one member, some with two, and so on. So that um, when the BJP 
contests an election, if it wins between 37 and 40 percent of the vote in a constituency, it is almost certain to win that constituency because the other 60, 63 percent is divided amongst multiple parties. And that essentially uh, is the challenge. Can one create enough of a unity of purpose with a common minimum program that would get all the parties together so as to not divide that majority. But the majority of the country has never voted for the BJP. They won the first general election with 31%, uh, and they won the second general election with 37%. So strictly speaking, um, you can. Uh, if you can just get everyone together to agree on one candidate to oppose the BJP candidate, you can conceivably win. But many of these parties also realize that depending on which party you pick to pro provide that one opposition candidate, there may be some opposition voters who would rather not vote for that chap uh, or that lady because of what their party stands for and therefore either want another choice or would rather see the BJP win than see this particular opposite. So we can't assume that all the 60% who didn't vote for the BJP when they had multiple choices would necessarily vote for the opposition candidate when you have one choice. So it's a complicated scenario. Right now the pollsters think that there is, there is no chance for a viable uh, alternative. Uh, obviously, those of us in the opposition who are still plugging away think there could be, but in any case, it can only work at the end as a coalition of sorts. Um, and, and many people, again, don't like the idea of a coalition government because our experience uh, with some coalition governments has been rather dismal. The, the VP Singh experiment, the Chandrasekhar government, the uh, Devagada government, and the Gujral government, each of which lasted for less than one year, and the Charan Singh government. So you have five governments that lasted for very short times because the coalitions eventually fell apart. But when you point out that the Vajpayee government and the Manmohan Singh era were actually also coalitions, though with a dominant party, uh, and therefore coalitions are not themselves necessarily um, destined to be short-lived, provided there is a strong linchpin inside them, um, that gives some hope. Many of us hope the Congress party would again be that linchpin. But right now the party, as you know, is going through a bit of an existential crisis and no one seems to believe that it can ever cross three figures and become that, that linchpin uh, that, that all of us have been striving uh, to create. I mean, uh, in the uh, last UPA government, Congress actually had 216 seats. Uh, then it plummeted in the BJP's first victory election of 2014. It plummeted to 44. It's now up to 52 plus one by election 53. But 53 seats um, is obviously not going to be enough to form the nucleus of a coalition government. You need at least three figures. So there's a, there's a challenge for each party. And then there are these other opposition parties strong in their own states, which have tried to reach out beyond their states and so far not succeeded. And that includes particularly the Trinamool Congress in Bengal, Samajwadi in UP, the NCP in Maharashtra. Uh, the DMK in Tamil Nadu has not gone beyond its own state, but they are strong there. Uh, as uh, nor indeed have the TRS in Telangana and the YSR in Andhra. But you've got a lot of regional parties that are capable of defeating the BJP in their own states. And so you could conceivably imagine some way of putting them all together to get a majority, but it didn't work um, uh, for two elections in a row, and we have to convince the voters that it can work the third time. There's a lady, Tharoor, in Washington, D.C., who has more power over words than any other Tharoor. Is she related to you? And the second part of the question, three books and three authors that you are uh, reading right now. Is it a lady, Tharoor, who controls words and journalism and <laughs> a lady with the last name, Tharoor? You're referring to my ex-wife or? Uh... Bhumika. Oh, I see. My, my lovely daughter-in-law. Yes, uh, Bhumika is uh, a managing editor of The Atlantic. And of course, uh, 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 the wife of Ishan and, uh, and, and uh, the mother of a lovely granddaughter called Kahani, which means story, which is, so my son was able to take paternity leave saying, I'm working on the story, <laughs> which is what he ended up doing. He was working on the Three Kahani. books that are captivating your mind right now. <coughs> Ooh, actually, that's a tougher question to answer because my Sundoku pile is out of control. I have a heck of a lot of unread books piled up. Um, there's a Malayalam novel I've been meaning to read for a year and a half. I've li that's literally how long I've had it, called Mustache, which created a huge controversy when it was serialized um, uh, by a Malayalam author called Harish, sort of one of the, the, the up-and-coming young, new, uh, big-name writers you should look out for. Um, uh, that would be in the fiction category. In nonfiction, there's an awful lot that's come out. There's a, there's, um, in fact, I, it would be invidious of me to pick one or two, because there are at least six equally clamoring for attention right now 
on my desk. But there's an awful lot of good writing uh, out there, and particularly, I would say, the books dealing with India uh, and with contemporary India, which, of course, is also a professional preoccupation of mine, so I can almost read it the way I read my homework at school. <laughs> That's something I need to read. There's Akar Patel's Price the Modi Years. There's Jaffre Lowe's book on Modi's India. Uh, the three or four that have come out in the last month or two in India that, that are uh, on my desk. Uh, there's also... Um, well, no, let, let me not name, because honestly, there are, there's a lot that's come out. But I always have more to read than I find time to. That's the honest truth. So again, bad example of time management. On that note, I think we give a big clap.